So Exodus chapter number 20, of course, very, very famous passage of Scripture. It has the Ten Commandments, and I'm actually going to be covering one of those Ten Commandments this evening, and that commandment is to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, which you find there in verse number 8. And there is a little bit of confusion about the Sabbath day in general. Um, I'm not saying at our church necessarily, but there's a lot of people who don't quite understand the Sabbath day. And um, I'm just going to start off by saying this. This sermon really isn't, uh, I'm not going to go into Seventh-day Adventists who, you know, always want to try to bring up the Sabbath day and talk to them about that. And here's one of the reasons why. I mean, uh, if you go out soul winning, you're trying to win someone to Christ and they want to bring up the day, just like Jehovah's Witnesses will bring up, well, what's the name of God? What's the name of God? And they just want to stick on that subject. I've had plenty of dealings with Jehovah's Witnesses. You can prove to them God has many names. You can show all these different names. You can show the same wording that they use when they say for the name, you know, uh, his name alone is Jehovah. And you can say, well, his name alone is excellent. You can show them all these things. We you know what? I've never wanted Jehovah's Witness to Christ by showing them the truth of just God's names. Right? They need to hear the gospel. And it's the same exact thing with Seventh-day Adventists. They need to get saved. They need to hear the gospel. I don't spend the time trying to convince them anything about what day of the week, you know, we should go to church on or what day of the week, you know, whatever, or keeping this, you know, this commandment and Ten Commandments. I don't get into that with them. So that's not what this sermon is about. This sermon is really just about understanding the scripture, understanding the Bible. Why do we not observe the Sabbath day today? And what is it all about? And what does it really entail to keep the Sabbath day? And we're going to dig into scripture and just see a lot more about that. And um, obviously, if you have some, somebody that's confused about this, where you could have multiple conversations with them, it's always a good thing, I think, to be able to know the Bible and be able to share different truths with them. But if it's just, uh, hey, I've got this one opportunity to give someone the gospel, give them the gospel. Don't, don't get sidetracked into these arguments because just as I've never won a Jehovah's Witness to, to Christ by just arguing over the name of God, I've never won a Seventh-day Adventist to Christ either by just arguing about the Sabbath day. It's not, it, it doesn't matter. So I, I've... Or my early years, I would, I would argue a little bit and prove them, no, see, and, and see how you're not keeping the Sabbath, right? And in the flesh, it makes you feel real good because you could just show them all these scriptures and stuff, but it doesn't do anything Amen. other than make you feel good. And for what? It really, it really has no value. So we don't need to show off our knowledge of scripture if you care about the person, let's just give them the gospel and try to get them saved. Now, I mean, obviously, there's, there's a time for people to, to receive a rebuke and maybe to, to try to humble them a little bit. I'm not saying that's not one way to, to help people in trying to get them saved, but they really just need to hear the power of the gospel. So let's dig into this. Now, all that being said, that's just a precursor. Let's look at what the Sabbath day is. First of all, the word Sabbath literally just means seventh. So there's some people that will say, you know, well, what's Sabbath, Saturday or Sunday, in re reference to our current calendar? Well, our current calendar, the first day of the week is Sunday, which means the last day of the week is Saturday, and there's seven days in the week, so Saturday is the Sabbath. And that's what it means. Anyway, you know, the, I, well, Saturday comes from, you know, mythology, Saturn Day or whatever, but like in, uh, in Spanish, it's Sabado. And it's the, uh, it's the Sabbath. So it just means, it literally just means seventh. So if you're coming one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, it's the seventh day. And the Bible teaches us here the exact same thing about the Sabbath day. Now, verse number eight there in Exodus chapter 20, the Bible reads, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. So notice it says six days you work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath. Sabbath means seventh. Of the Lord thy God, in it thou shalt not do any work, thou, 
nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and held it. And now there's a, a bunch of things we can learn just in general right off the bat in this, in this passage. One, we have the reference to creation. And this is one more evidence or one more proof that when the Bible in Genesis chapter 1 talks about the creation, it's six literal days that God created everything that you see here. This isn't a sermon about the creation, but we're covering the Ten Commandments here, specifically the Sabbath day, and this is what brings up creation. Now, when you read Genesis chapter 1, you'll see in the evening and the morning were the first day, in the evening and the morning were the second day, in the evening and the morning were the third day. If that's not clear enough to spell out, we're talking about literal, you know, 24-hour days, the sun rises, the sun sets. That's a day. Well, it also mentions here that just like God worked for six days and rested on the seventh, we're going to keep the Sabbath day holy. And that's the commandment given to man. God worked six days, rested the seventh. You work six days, rest on the seventh. And the reason I bring it up is because there's all these theories out there about this theistic evolution where people want to mix in the world's science falsely so-called theories of evolution and tie it into scripture to make them both work but they're completely incompatible they cannot be merged together it is impossible to merge evolution which is this random set of occurrences and natural selection and and you know things becoming more complicated from less complicated or it, it doesn't happen in this life it just doesn't work and you can go through the whole order that the scripture gives in, in the book of Genesis. You know, there's light before the sun. There's plants before the sun. That doesn't work at all. You can't jam that into any type of evolutionary theory. It doesn't work. You got to believe one or the other. So I just bring that up. I, I could go on and on about the whole creation thing, and maybe I will sometime soon because that's something I feel strongly about because I was pretty upset when I found out that I was deceived for my whole life about how this planet got here and how we exist today. So um, I was very thankful after I got saved. I just saw the truth on that because that was my number one question after I got saved was, what about evolution? It's the first thing that popped in my mind. So, um, in any case, let's get back to the Sabbath now. Um, one thing I want to point out about the Sabbath day in verse number 10 there, let's look at that again. The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord. In it thou shalt not do any work. And this is where most people kind of just stop and think that that's the Sabbath. Well, you just rest on the Sabbath. You don't do any work. But it's not just you. Notice this verse continues on. It says, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. Nobody's supposed to be doing work. It's not just something that you personally keep. You got to make sure your whole household, if you have people, you know, serving you, men servants, maid servants, if you have a business, if you got people working for you, nobody works. It's not good enough to just say, well, I'm keeping the Sabbath. But I'm going to go and go to a restaurant and order food. Why? Because you're going to be served. You're going to have a manservant or a maidservant bring you your food, cook your food for you, and serve it up on a dish. All of a sudden, you're breaking the Sabbath. So there are a lot of ramifications to the Sabbath day. He's saying, I don't want you doing anything. I don't want anybody doing anything. He says, even the stranger that is within that gate. So even a foreigner. It's not just like, oh, well, they're not a believer, so we'll just, they, you know, we'll let them work for me. No, you can't be making anybody work for you. And what's really interesting, if you were to apply this to today's society, today's world, we have a lot of people providing services 
for us right into our home. There are people working every day of the week down at the power plant. There are people working all the time providing you your services, your utilities, your water, your, you know, all these things that come into your house. All of a sudden, it's going to make it very difficult to try to keep the Sabbath day. Now, I'm not saying this in a, in a mocking way as, oh, oh, how silly it would be to try to keep the Sabbath, right? That's not it at all. If we, if we had to keep the Sabbath, then we would have to think about these things and be real about it. I'm saying it because the people who do think you have to keep the Sabbath generally don't, I don't think they think about it very hard. Yeah. Yeah, right. It just becomes something, oh, well, we're not going to work today. But if you really wanted to be true to Scripture, you'd have to consider all of the ramifications of that and make sure you're doing those things that keep the Sabbath. Um, flip back to Exodus chapter 16. One more point on Exodus 20. Flip over to Exodus 16. We're going to start reading verse number 22. But the Bible says, Six days shalt thou labor. And this is a total side note, but, you know, we live in a, in a society that's just, I can only work 40 hours a week and I can't work any more than that. And I need to have all my vacations and I need to have all this time off and that time off and paid time and everything else. God says you're going to work six days. Amen. You get one day of rest and why don't you go and work for six days? Yeah. Keep yourself busy doing something. You're not entitled to just all of this extra time and, 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 to, to not work. Exodus 16, verse 22. The Bible says, And it came to pass that on the sixth day they gathered twice as much bread, two omers for one man, and all the rulers of the congregation came and told Moses. And he said unto them, This is that which the Lord hath said, Tomorrow is the rest of the holy Sabbath unto the Lord. Bake that which you will bake today, and see that you will see, and that which remaineth over lay up for you to be kept until the morning. Now, this is a very, very interesting story, because this is, in context, this is talking about manna. When the children of Israel would go out and collect the manna that was outside on the ground, just like the dew from heaven, when there's dew on the, on the plants and everything, you wake up and you see all this dew, well, there was food for them, just like that do out on outside. And they would go and collect it, gather it up, and eat it. Now, the way that God had designed them to be fed when they were out in the wilderness was that they had to rely on that manna being there every single day. They were relying on God to give them that food from heaven. And they could not store it up. They couldn't collect extra and, and stockpile it just in case. They had to live by faith. They had to live every single day by the manna that's provided for them. And what is, besides the miracle that they could just go outside and collect food and eat it, that is a huge miracle in and of itself. Every day, if they tried to save up any extra food, they didn't eat, they didn't consume it, they wanted to save it for the next day, it would breed worms. It would become totally unusable. You could not eat it. It would go bad. It would stink. It would have worms. It would be rotten. You couldn't eat it. But you know what? There was one day you could do that. On Friday, you can gather extra and you can have enough for the next day. And if it just so happened to be a Friday, it's not going to breed worms. It's not going to stink. Talk about miraculous. I mean, what type of substance is there that's going to know what day of the week it is and not breed worms and not stink and not go bad and not go rotten? It's God providing for the children of Israel and for every single thing is considered. He knows he already has this law. I don't want you going out and working on the Sabbath day. I don't want you even going out and collecting this food. However you want to prepare it, and we'll read this in just a minute. However you prepare it, you, you know, if you boil it, if you, if you, you know, fry it up, however you prepare your meal, get it prepared, get it ready to go, because on the Sabbath day, I don't want you working. He knows you have to eat, but he's like, I don't want you preparing food. I want you just to rest. And that's what it calls 
And, and notice this word is going to come up multiple times in Scripture. It's the rest. The Sabbath day is a rest. It's a rest. It's going to be really important when I tie things up at the end. Verse 23 again, And he said unto them, This is that which the Lord hath said, Tomorrow is the rest of the holy Sabbath unto the Lord. Bake that which you will bake today, and seed that you will seethe, and that which remaineth over lay up for you to be kept until the morning. And they laid it up till the morning, as Moses bade, and it did not stink, neither was there any worm therein. And Moses said, Eat that today, for today is a Sabbath unto the Lord. Today ye shall not find it in the field. So not only did it not stink, but that that Saturday there was no food to be collected. It just didn't. It just wasn't on the ground at all. So every other day it was out there, but not on the Sabbath day. Verse twenty six: Six days ye shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, in it there shall be none. And it came to pass that there went out some of the people on the seventh day for to gather, and they found none. And the Lord said unto Moses, How long refuse ye to keep my commandments and my laws? So there's always those people, right? There's always somebody that, that just wants to test it out, that wants to see, well, wait, I want to go get my food. Instead of just abiding by faith in what the Lord says. So they go out there and God's just like, how long are they going to keep doing this? Uh, verse number 29, See for that the Lord hath given you the Sabbath, therefore he giveth you on the sixth day the bread of two days. Abide ye every man in his place, let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. Again, we're seeing that rest. Flip over to Exodus chapter 35. Exodus 35, we're going to see how serious God is about the Sabbath day. Because you would think, well, it's just a day of rest. It's not a big deal, right? I mean, that's how we treat, I don't know about you, but Saturday is my day of rest. If I do get any rest <laughs> in general, it's my day to do work at home and, and do a lot of other things. But it is my day to basically do whatever I want to do. And um, for the most part. So I kind of treat that day as not, it's not like that big of a deal, right? Whether I rest or not, to me, it's not a big deal. But when God created the Sabbath day and commanded that this is to be kept, it's actually a very, very big deal. It's very important that you keep the Sabbath day. Exodus 35, verse number one, the Bible reads, And Moses gathered all the congregation of the children of Israel together and said unto them, These are the words which the Lord hath commanded that you should do them. Six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day there shall be to you an holy day, a Sabbath of rest to the Lord. Whosoever doeth work therein shall be put to death. Ye shall kindle no fire throughout your habitations upon the Sabbath day. So another example of doing work is just something as simple as kindling a fire. So it's pretty restrictive in a sense of like what you can do on the Sabbath. God just really doesn't want you doing it much of it, much of anything. He wants you to be able to rest and not do anything that would be considered work. Now, and it was, and he's so serious about this that he puts the death penalty on someone who would break the Sabbath day. And just, just keep all this in mind because it's, it's all going to fit together. The, the light of the New Testament is going to shine on all of this in the Old Testament. And it's become very, very clear why this is such a big deal. Because you say, well, why does God care so much if we rest? And, it's not, and, and why does he care so much he's going to put someone to death if they work? I mean, if they're not tired, why do they need to rest, right? Well, because there's more to it. <coughs> than just you getting rest. Now, God did create the Sabbath as something that would benefit man. Having that rest, not overdoing it, not working yourself too hard, but giving, giving man an opportunity to rest. But that's not the main point. And just as the Bible says that, you know, there shall no wise, you know, one jot or one tittle shall no wise pass from the law until all be fulfilled. The law really has fulfillment in Jesus Christ. 
And we're going to see that at the end. Like I said, we're going to turn the book of Hebrews and it'll explain completely what the Sabbath day is all about. But let's keep going. We got one more passage I want to look at in the Old Testament. Turn to Numbers chapter 15 before we dive into the New Testament. In Exodus 35, 2, that's why I make an extra point. We already read this, but it said that the Sabbath is a holy day. Just keep that phrase in mind, too. It's a holy day, a Sabbath of rest. And if you're working on that day, you're going to be put to death. Numbers 15, we're going to read in verse number 32. Numbers 15, verse number 32. And while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man that gathered sticks upon the Sabbath day. And they that found him gathering sticks brought him unto Moses and Aaron and unto all the congregation. And they put him in ward because it was not declared what should be done to him. And the Lord said unto Moses, the man shall be surely put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones without the camp. And all the congregation brought him without the camp and stoned him with stones. And he died as the Lord commanded Moses. This is no joke. I mean, this is, this is a big deal to God. He said he didn't want you kindling a fire. This guy was just picking up sticks, going out and gathering sticks. He said, no, no, I don't want you working. Obviously, there's a reason for him picking up the sticks, whether he's cleaning up his yard or gathering up firewood or whatever he's doing. He's working. And it can be, I think the reason why this is even in Scripture, because they wanted clarification from the Lord. Like, is this punishable by death? Like, what should we do with this guy? I mean, he wasn't plowing his field. He wasn't doing something that you might think of like, well, yeah, that's, you know, that's work. Like he's working. He was picking up some sticks. Like, God, what do you want us to do with this guy? And this is what the Lord said. He said, nope, he's broken the Sabbath. And he didn't want him doing even that little bit of work. Now, I don't know about you, but if I thought that the Sabbath is applicable for us today. And I can see how serious God is of putting a death penalty punishment on breaking the Sabbath. I would be trying really, 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 really hard not to screw it up. If you have respect for God's word. Now, just because there's nobody enforcing that law doesn't mean we should treat God's law any lighter, right? We, there's some things, some aspects of God's law today that are legal, but it doesn't mean we should just be flippant about it. Abortion is a great example. The Bible says thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not kill, yet it's legal in the right setting to kill a human being inside the womb. That's one great example. Well, murderers are supposed to be put to death. And that's what the Bible says. And just because there's a lack of anyone enforcing God's law doesn't mean we should treat it any lighter. That's right. Amen. So if I thought that we had to keep the Sabbath, and yeah, this world wouldn't be enforcing those laws, but if we had to keep it, I'd be like, man, we got to keep this. We got to do everything we can not to break the Sabbath. Now, obviously, I don't believe we have to keep it. Um, that's been evidenced just by everything that we do, uh, you know, on, on Saturday and everything else. But um, it, it really is serious. I mean, if God is assigning a death penalty for someone gathering sticks, it's a serious crime. It's a serious thing with, with God. Look at, uh, turn now to New Testament, go to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. This is, I think there's a lot that's missed when people only read the New Testament and don't read the Old Testament and don't have the full picture of everything because there's a teaching about the Pharisees in Scripture that people are super screwed up on too. Now, the Pharisees weren't good guys. They were false teachers. They had a false religion. They basically practiced the religion of Judaism that we know today. It's the religion that rejected Jesus Christ. It's a religion that believes there is a Christ, but it's not Jesus Christ. They're Antichrist. 
And that's what the Pharisees believed. Okay, and they have a wicked religion. And it's pretty similar, very close to what they believed at the time of Jesus. What we see today in the conservative Judaism uh, religion. But what people have this concept of is that the Pharisees were really good at keeping the law. That's what people will tell you. It, people will call churches like ours, you're legalistic, you're like a Pharisee, because we care about God's law and we want to follow God's law to the best of our ability. We care about not breaking the word of the Lord. So people say, oh, you're real legalistic. Don't you know we're under grace? Yes, we know we're under grace. That's why we go out and preach grace to everybody and preach how easy it is to be saved. And you don't have to keep the law to be saved. But at the same time, we know that we don't want to be mocking God and mocking his word by just being real flippant about it and not caring. Well, yeah, I know he said that. And I know that made him real angry. I know he killed people over that, but whatever. We don't have that attitude. So if God's expecting things of me, yeah, I want to be really careful to make sure I'm doing what's right by God. And if you call that legalistic, then go ahead, call me legalistic. But you know what? That's not how the Pharisees were. And that's how people will try to spin it. See, it's very obvious in Scripture that the Pharisees were not good people, that they're not people to follow. They're not good examples. They're none of that. But people have this false concept of thinking that the Pharisees are like independent fundamental Baptists that are, that are real careful about following rules. They weren't. They're always trying to get out of the rules, trying to get out of. They're like, hey, can we divorce a, a, a woman for any reason? No. It's, you know, it's the exact opposite. There was only one reason for a man that, to be able to divorce a woman that, that was even given as a caveat in the, in the Scripture. But we're not going to get into all that tonight. But... Um, that is what the Pharisees were. They were always trying to get out of things, not trying to obey the law from a, from a heart, from a pure heart, yeah. with integrity. They were always looking at condemning other people and trying to use a, the law to do that while making themselves appear good. But the big problem with the Pharisees, they were hypocrites. And that's why almost every time you see Jesus dealing with them, he brings up their hypocrisy. He brings up how they say these things and they don't do them. They claim to believe in Moses' law, but they don't follow his laws. They were total hypocrites. And we're going to see that here in Matthew chapter 12. One of the ways, one of the big things that drove the Pharisees nuts about Jesus is that they were saying that he broke the Sabbath. And that's, that just drove them crazy because they wanted to make sure, they were like the Sabbath police on everybody, and especially on Jesus Christ, and they wanted to make sure that, that you know, he was going to be put to death for doing good. And this just demonstrates that they weren't saved because they had no way of discerning God's law and what is acceptable and what's not. So they can see a story like, hey, this guy gathered sticks and he's put to death. So they wrongly applied not being able to do anything, especially in the terms of like healing somebody, just helping someone out. If someone's in trouble, you know, God didn't create the Sabbath day just so that, well, if you happen to get hurt, if you happen to stumble and fall down and, and have a problem, then too bad for you because it's a Sabbath day. That's not what it's all about. That goes against the whole spirit of the law. And, um, and it doesn't even follow the letter of the law. He's talking about laboring and he brings up all these other things um, with your, your manservant, your maidservant, and doing that type of work. Gathering six, you're doing work. You're not doing good. But we're going we're gonna to see the difference here. Jesus explains it really well. Matthew chapter 12, verse number 1, the Bible reads, At that time Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn, and his disciples were in hungered, and began to pluck the ears of corn and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. But he said unto them, Have ye not read? And he says this to them twice. Have you not read? Don't you know the word of God? Don't you know the scripture? 
Because what they're doing is they're falsely accusing them. They're, they're wrongly condemning them when they actually aren't doing anything that's wrong. Them eating the corn when they're hungry, being with Jesus, preaching the gospel, in this situation was not breaking the Sabbath day. And he explains that to him. It says here, he says, Have you not read what David did when he was in hunger and they that were with him, how he entered into the house of God and did eat the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them which were with him, but only for the priests? Which... Yes, under, under all normal circumstances, that would be against, you know, against God's law. You're not supposed to do that. But when it comes to just food being there, if someone's going to die or if someone you know, needs to have food, God's going to make a, an allowance. Okay, yeah, that person can eat. Right. If somebody is hurt and in a ditch and dying and it's a Sabbath day, he's going to say, yeah, I know I don't want you to work, but you could go ahead and help that person. Right. You can you can keep that person alive. You can sustain them. And that's not what the, the Bible is, is trying to make laws against. There's no laws against doing good in Scripture. Verse number five, he says, or. Have you not read in the law how that on the Sabbath days the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? How did the priests profane the Sabbath? Well, they're working. They're performing sacrifices. They're making sure that the fire doesn't go out. They're making, you know, they're doing their service in the tabernacle every day of the week. So he's saying, how, you know, there's no contradiction here. You're failing to realize the whole point and what the commandment is about. And you're misapplying it. Now, they already knew that the priests can do those things, but they weren't thinking about that at all. They're saying, well, why, why would that be? And um, he says in verse number six, but I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. But if you had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. You would not have condemned the guiltless. So Jesus is saying that disciples were not guilty of anything. They were not guilty of breaking the Sabbath by taking that corn when they were doing good, when they were hungry and, and when they needed to eat something because they're serving the Lord and doing the Lord's service. That was not breaking the Sabbath day. Verse 8, for the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. And people will, turn, will, will focus on that verse 8 and say, well, the only reason they weren't guilty is because Jesus just can say, since he's the Lord, he could just say they weren't breaking any commandments because he was with them. But that's not what he said, because in the verse before that he said, you wouldn't have condemned the guiltless. They're not guiltless just because Jesus Christ is Lord. They were guiltless because he brought up these other references as to other people who have done things that seemingly might be breaking the law, but in that situation, it's not breaking the law. That is acceptable. That was okay. That was following the spirit of the law. We get a couple of details in Mark. Stay in Matthew. We're going to keep reading in Matthew 12. But on this particular story, there's a, there's a parallel passage in Mark 2, verse 27 says, And he said unto them, The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. So he's explaining the Sabbath isn't just so important that like it's all about the Sabbath day and not about man who's made in the image of God. He says the, it's, it's the other way around. The Sabbath day was made for man. So we don't let men die because it's the Sabbath day. You're going to not let man die even if it is the Sabbath day. That's the way that that works. He says, therefore, the son of man is Lord also of the Sabbath in that chapter. Mark, let's keep reading in Matthew 12, verse number nine. And when he was departed thence, he went into their synagogue and behold, there was a man which had his hand withered. And they asked him, saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath days that they might accuse him? So notice the Pharisees again. Is it that they wanted to know? Can we heal people on the Sabbath day? No, they're asking that, that they might accuse him. They already think that you can't heal on the Sabbath day. That was already their belief. 
The reason why they're asking is because they want him to say, yes, you can. Because they want to accuse him and put him to death. Now, we've all, I already did a sermon a few weeks ago on other times when they're trying to trap Jesus Christ. You know, and he was very wise in his response because they're trying to put him in a situation that there's not really a right answer. But he doesn't have to be that careful with the Sabbath day because they already are just wrong to think that you can't heal on the Sabbath day. So it's not, what, however he answers them, he, he could answer them very, very, very clearly and not have to worry about being in a, in a catch-22 type of situation where you know, anything he says is going to be used against him. Because they just simply, that's why when they ask him these things, he just heals the people. He's like, I'm not just going to tell you, I'm actually going to do it. Yes, you can heal on the Sabbath day. That, I mean, he was real strong about that. Um, let's read here. It says in verse 11, And he said unto them, What man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep? And if it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, will he not lay hold on it and lift it out? How much then is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore, it is lawful to do well on the Sabbath days. Then saith he to the man, Stretch forth thine hand, and he stretched it forth, and it was restored whole like as the other. Then the Pharisees went out and held a council against him, how they might destroy him. So he very clearly says it is. But before he even answers their question, he brings up, he's like, he's pointing out their hypocrisy. Well, which one of you? If you've got an animal, you've got a sheep that's fallen into a ditch, and it's the Sabbath day. You're going to go out and you're going to take care of your property, right? Because you don't want to lose that sheep. He's like, I know that you'll all go out. You're worried about your money. You're worried about your property. You're going to go pull that out and say that you're guiltless in the Sabbath day because your sheep's out there. And he's saying, how much more valuable is a man? And again, we get some other details in the book of Mark. Turn to Luke 13. I'm just going to read over a few of these. Because um, in Mark 3, verse 4, the Bible says, And he saith unto them, Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days, or to do evil, to save life, or to kill? But they held their peace. And this is, again, another parallel passage. See, they asked him, Is it lawful to heal? And he turns around and asks them, Is it lawful to heal? Is it lawful to save life or to kill? And they don't answer. See, they, they don't want to say Jesus came out and told them they didn't want to say anything. And then it says, and when he had looked round about on them with anger. He was angry because they had this view of the Sabbath day thinking that you can't even heal someone on the Sabbath. They had made Jesus Christ angry. Being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, he saith unto the man, stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it out and his hand was restored whole as the other. So before he even healed the man, he's, he's looking at these people and he's just angry and sad at the same time because they've hardened their hearts so much against people that they think you can't even heal someone on the Sabbath day. Luke chapter 13. We're going to read verse number 14. The Bible says, And the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation because that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day and said unto the people, There are six days in which men ought to work. In them therefore come and be healed and not on the Sabbath day. The Lord then answered him and said, Thou hypocrite, doth not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or his ass from the stall and lead him away to, be, to watering? He said, You take care of your animals. Again, it's just one more example. And ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound, lo, these 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? And when he had said these things, all his adversaries were ashamed and all the people rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him. If you've got a belief that just completely contradicts some of the most basic truths about God loving people and, and wanting them to be saved, it just completely flies in the face of that and saying, nope, you, you need to rethink that. I'll read this for you in John 7. Turn, if you would, to Colossians chapter 2. John 7, 22, I'm going to read this while you're turning to Colossians 2. Moses, therefore, gave unto you circumcision, not because it is of Moses, but of the fathers. And ye on the Sabbath day circumcise a man. 
If a man on the Sabbath day receives circumcision that the law of Moses should not be broken, are you angry at me because I have made a man every whit whole on the Sabbath day? Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Again, their, their hypocrisy and their failure to understand. Within God's own law, there's this seeming contradiction. Because on one hand, he's saying, don't break the Sabbath. But on the other hand, he's saying, hey, the man-child, when he's eight days old, needs to be circumcised. Those are two laws that will come into conflict with each other at some point because men children are born every single day. <laughs> and when you start doing the eight days, one of them is going to be born on a Friday, right? And that eighth day is going to land on a Sabbath. So what do you do about that? Well, you keep the law of Moses that says circumcise them on the eighth day. And if it happens to be on a Sabbath, then it happens to be on a Sabbath because that's not the work that God is talking about that you have to take a rest from. Keeping the commandments of the Lord don't stop because of the day of the week. That's not why the Sabbath was instituted. It wasn't instituted for you to not obey God's commandments. And that's why he's saying, don't judge according to the appearance, because the appearance would be like, well, I don't know, maybe you're breaking the Sabbath. He said, judge righteous judgment. The righteous judgment is that, no, it's, there's nothing wrong with that. And just like there's nothing wrong with, you know, literally cutting away flesh, because that's what circumcision is, you're actually wounding a child in, in a sense, right? Because you're, you're taking some skin away, some flesh away. He's like, I've just put the flesh back on. I've, I've made somebody whole. How is that really any different? It's not. Healing someone, obviously, is totally appropriate. But Colossians chapter 2, 16, remember we saw earlier that the Sabbath was referred to in the Old Testament as a holy day. It's a day of rest. It's a Sabbath of rest. Look at Colossians chapter 2, because this is going to explain why in the New Testament... I don't believe we have to follow the law of the Sabbath. That it's not something that we need to observe today. This is one of the reasons. We're going to go into a few of them. Ultimately, I believe Christ has fulfilled that aspect of the law when he died on the cross and rose again from the dead. But we're going to see a few other examples first before we get into that final place. Look at Colossians 2.16. The Bible says, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink. And again, we don't observe the dietary restrictions either. In the Old Testament, there's all kinds of laws between the separating clean beasts from unclean and saying you could eat these and not eat these and these are the ones you know, that you're allowed to eat. But in the New Testament, that's been lifted. That's another sermon for another time. But in this passage, he's basically covering both things here. Don't let someone else judge you in meat or in drink, saying, oh, you can't eat that. Or in respect of an holy day, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days. He said, don't let anyone judge you about the Sabbath days. That's pretty clear, pretty straightforward in English. Okay, well, if, I can, if I'm not going to let someone judge me about keeping the Sabbath days, then apparently... We don't have to keep the Sabbath days. He says in verse 17, he gives a little bit further explanation, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. There was a purpose for these laws being in place. There was a purpose for the Sabbath day. There was a purpose for the dietary restrictions, but that purpose was for them to, to show a shadow of things to come, but those things have already come. So it's no longer something that God tells us that we need to observe or follow because it's already happened. Turn to Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter number 14. <clears throat> Verse number 5, the Bible reads, One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. This passage is letting us know that God gives us freedom, liberty to choose for ourselves whether or not we are going to place the status of one day above another or not. 
Now, you can apply this to, to, hol to holidays, which is short for holy days. Some people like to celebrate Christmas. Some people don't. Some people want to celebrate Easter. Some people don't. And I'm talking about setting aside time to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ or the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you don't want to celebrate, you know what? You don't have to. And I'm not going to judge you for it. I don't care if you do or not. The Bible is giving us a freedom here. But I don't want to be judged if I choose to esteem a day above another. I want to esteem this day above another because I'm going to esteem that day for the Lord. Either way, the Bible gives us the freedom to do with that what we want. And hey, if you want to esteem a day to take a rest, go for it. If you want to esteem Sunday, a lot of people do. We don't want to do anything on Sunday. We want to go to church. We're going to spend time with our family. And that's what we're going to do on Sunday. Great. Good for you. And someone else says, well, I'm going to go to church and then I'm going to go to work. And I'll go to church again and then I'm going to go to work. Have at it. You've got freedom. Verse 6, he that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord. And he that regardeth not the day, to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not, to the Lord he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. Basically, whether you observe a day or not, you still should be recognizing the Lord. And it's all about God anyways. And whether you eat or not, either way you're giving God thanks. Turn to... Um, Luke chapter 4. I'm going to cover this real quickly and I'll close up. Esteeming one day above another, that wouldn't make sense if we did have to observe the Sabbath day because we would have to esteem one day to not do any work. We would have to esteem a day to, um, to observe the Sabbath. And just like in Colossians 2, it says, don't let anyone judge you in the Sabbath days in respect of a holy day. Romans 14 kind of fits in perfectly with that teaching. Okay, you want to observe a day? Great. You don't? Fine. You don't have to. And we ought not to be judging people one way or the other, really. And that's another reason why if someone wants to, to not do any work on the Sabbath, I'm not going to get a big argument about it with them. Go ahead. Just like the person in Romans 14, you, could, you read the whole passage later, talks about someone who doesn't eat meat. And it says that they're weak. <laughs> Okay, it's, it's clear on, on kind of who's right and who's wrong, but it doesn't matter. Is what the Bible's here. It doesn't matter. If someone doesn't want to eat meat, fine. Go ahead. I'm not, gonna, I'm not even going to cause that person to stumble and, and put anything in their face and try to, you know, wave some bacon around in front of them or whatever, trying to get them to, you know, to, to sin against their own conscience. Sin against the, what they believe to be wrong. Now, they may not realize that God has lifted dietary restrictions or whatever, and that we have freedom to eat the food that we want, whatever we want to eat, but that's fine. No reason to, to get in an argument and start judging. Doesn't matter. Same way with the days of the week. Uh, Luke chapter 4, I think we, should also, we can also take this uh, and apply this as to when we congregate together as a church. I have no problems with people going to church on Saturday at all or Friday or Thursday or Wednesday or Tuesday or Monday or Sunday. It doesn't matter to me. I think we could esteem whatever day we want to to gather together. Now, in our church, there are set times that we meet. There has to be so that we all know when are we going to gather together. But whether we choose to do that on a Sunday or on a Saturday or whatever day, I don't think that matters at all. I don't think God cares what day of the week we choose to, get to congregate together. We can esteem whatever day we want to do that. There's a lot of reasons that we choose to meet on a Sunday, and ultimately it just kind of has more to do with tradition than anything else. Some people will turn to, and we're in Luke chapter 4, will try to tell, tell you that you should uh, have church on Saturday because of what you see in Scripture. Look at Luke 4 as an example of this. 
in verse 14, the Bible says, And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went out a fame of him through all the region round about, and he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. So Jesus had a custom of going to the synagogue on Saturday and teaching and reading. And we see the disciples do similar thing. They, they'll go into the synagogue on Saturday. You know what that tells me is that the Jews had a custom of going into their synagogue on Saturday. That's what that tells me. Because I don't have a law that says you must go to church on Saturday or on the Sabbath day. I don't see that even for the Old Testament of you have to go to the synagogue on Saturday. That was just something that they did. Jesus had a custom of doing that. Great. There's nothing wrong with that. But what I also see is that that is, seems much more applied to the Jews, to their synagogue. That's what it says, the synagogue. But when we look at the New Testament, when it talks about the church, we see church meeting on the first day of the week. And I'll just give you a few references for that. I'm going to read for you from John 20, 19, Acts 20, verse 7, and 1 Corinthians 16, 2. John 20, 19 says that the same day at even, evening being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled, so the disciples were all assembled together for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. Now, it's not clear that this was actually like a full church service, but the disciples were gathered together on the first day of the week. Acts 20, verse 7, And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow and continue his speech until midnight. So they've gathered together and Paul preaches to him on the first day of the week. 1 Corinthians 16, 2, Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. So he's saying, hey, all of you put aside this money that Paul was going to come and collect and bring to, to the saints that were in need on the first day of the week. Well, they're probably gathering together if they're putting that money aside on the first day of the week. So we have this tradition in Scripture. But again, there's no hard commandment. I'm just trying to give you a reason why Sunday seems to be a pretty reasonable day to choose. You've got to choose sometime anyways to go to church. Why not just keep this tradition? There's nothing wrong with it. By the way, Jesus Christ rose on the first day of the week. The first day of the week, the, the tomb was empty. So if we're going to pick a day to, you know, be all about Christ... Why not the day that, that the Bible is very clear that he rose from the grave? You know, these are all just reasons. But it doesn't have to be hard and fast, well, you must, you must congregate on Sunday. No. It's just reasoning behind why we do what we do. But that is not some hard, fast rule. And Sunday is not the Sabbath day. Because it's not the seventh day, it's the first day. Turn to Hebrews 4. I'm going to close with this. Hebrews chapter 4. What is the purpose of the Sabbath? And ultimately, why do we really not? We have all these other evidences we kind of went over about not esteeming, you know, esteeming one day above another and let everyone be persuaded in his own mind. Well, there is one aspect, though, of this when it comes to the Sabbath day that I really I don't believe that anybody should be intentionally trying to keep the Sabbath day as the Sabbath day commanded of the Lord. I actually think that that would be blasphemous at this point to try to do that just as much as it would be to offer up a, a lamb sacrifice on an altar. And it has to do with the purpose of the Sabbath day. Like I said, if you want to take a day and, and have a day of rest, great. If you think that's a good idea, if you think that's something that, that you know, because God commanded a Sabbath day and you think it's healthy for you, it's good for you, great. Go ahead and do that. But we don't need to be concerned about the law, the commandment of keeping that Sabbath day where if somebody gathered sticks on the Sabbath day or did any type of work, they'd be put to death. Because Jesus Christ, it, it was all a picture of Jesus Christ. He is the fulfillment of that Sabbath. He is our rest. Amen. The Sabbath day is a day of rest where no work is to be done. Our salvation comes through the Lord Jesus Christ. 
There is no works that can be done in order to enter into the rest of the Lord. You cannot have any works. You can't even have the smallest bit of works like picking up sticks because if you're trying to add that to your rest of Jesus Christ, you're trying to add that to your salvation, you're going to go to hell. This is why God had such a stringent punishment and, and just was very, very clear. There is to be no work done on the Sabbath because the Sabbath day represented the rest that you get through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews 4 explains that perfectly. Let's look down at verse number one. The Bible says, let us therefore fear, lest the promise being left of us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest. As he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise. It was the seventh day, the Sabbath day. And God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place, again, if they shall enter into my rest. Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. He's tying scriptures together here, folks. He's saying, God created the earth. The seventh day he rested. God wants people to enter into his rest. Well, some people weren't able to enter into that rest because of unbelief. He's, he's, he's connecting the dots for us. Verse 7, again, he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time, as it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that has entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works as God did from his. I'm entered into the rest of Jesus Christ because I, I stopped my works thinking that my works were going to save me in any way, shape, or form. And I'm resting completely in the finished work of Jesus Christ. He is my rest. And praise God for that. Amen. What a relief. I don't have to work at all to be saved. Not even a little bit. Amen. Jesus is that rest. Verse 11 says, Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. We're going to labor and work not to attain that rest because we're going to eventually have the, the completion of that rest. When we breathe our last breath, when the Lord comes back and, and raptures our bodies up with our soul in the air, you know, to be with the Lord, that is the, the totality of our salvation and our rest where we're completely done and entered into him with that rest. And until that day comes, we're going to keep working. We're going to keep laboring. Amen. And for that very reason, we don't need to observe the Sabbath day anymore. Jesus fulfilled that aspect and just as one last point, and, and I'm not going to prove this from Scripture tonight, but you can look it up for yourself. Very, very interesting point going along with the Sabbath days. And I didn't really mention this, but I probably should have. Yeah. Sabbath means the seventh. The seventh day is, is the Sabbath day. But there were also other Sabbath days in Scripture that were holy days that were set apart that basically had the same rules and restrictions that the Sabbath they had. And there were a few of these days throughout the year that God had, had ordained as just saying, okay, this is a Sabbath day. The Passover was one of those days, right? Then there was, if you, if you understand the Passover, there was a Feast of Unleavened Bread, which started the day after the Passover. Now, when Jesus Christ was killed, when he was crucified on the cross, when he died, was the Passover. Jesus Christ was dead for three days and three nights. 
And don't be deceived by what the world calls or the Catholics call, you know, Good Friday, thinking that Jesus died on a Friday and then was already risen on a Sunday because you can't get three days and three nights of his of his death from Friday to Sunday. It's mathematically impossible. But when Jesus died as the Passover lamb on Passover, that Passover, that first day, no one's doing any work because it was a Sabbath to the Lord. The following day, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, another Sabbath day, no one's to be doing any work. And then, guess what the next day was? Saturday. Nobody's doing any work because it's another Sabbath. You had Sabbath, Sabbath, Sabbath for the three days and the three nights that Jesus Christ was dead before he rose again from the dead. Securing our salvation, our eternal life, no one was supposed to be doing any work at all. How amazing is our God that it all just so happened through the calendars, through the years, that that very year that Jesus Christ was being crucified, that everything just lined up perfectly to have Sabbath, 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 all in a row, no one doing any work. Jesus Christ is our rest. Take the time and, and, and go through. It's a very interesting study. Like I said, I, I, I like to prove everything from Scripture, but um, that is a very, a very cool uh, uh, truth from Scripture. Don't get caught up in arguments with people who want to bring you under, the, under this law of the Sabbath day. It's not applicable. Jesus Christ is our rest. But let's not be flippant about all of the law and I mean, we shouldn't even be flippant about the Sabbath day, but it's, it's not something that, that really is a thing for us. And if someone wants to esteem one day above another, God bless them. If another person doesn't want to, God bless them. It's about right to have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for the, the clear teaching that you give us in Scripture. Lord, help us to have um, hearts to understand your laws that we can judge righteously and, and that we could make the proper applications when necessary, Lord. And I pray that you would please just help us to go out and spread the good news of the rest that comes through faith in Jesus Christ, Lord, and help us to, to reach the lost, reach those that have been deceived, and um, just help us to, to shine the glorious light of the gospel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.